what, when, and where uh, questions. We're getting uh, more practical now. And I, I think that this is the first big question to ask, and you may already be an established writer, but, but what do you write about? And how do you discover the things that you should write about? Because we can't all be experts in everything. We can't write in all different styles as well. We need to be able to focus. And so uh, I, I just ask you to reflect on what life-giving truths do you feel passionate about? Uh, it, it might be that, that you've, you've got something you just wish that people grasped and knew about, and that will become a motivation for you. But, but even more, perhaps, what enslaving lies do you feel angry about? What, what perverse or wrong ideas, which are having bad effects, perhaps on people you love, also because they're believing them and living by them, do you feel angry about and want to counter and uh, you know, uh, turn over? Is, is there a revolutionary uh, spirit in you to, to want to shape the future? And then, of course, what's your area of expertise? Uh, no good if a surgeon like me tries to write about uh, something which I've got no training whatsoever. But, but there'll be things that, by virtue of our personality, our academic training, our interests, that we will know a lot about more than other people about. So they're things that we are equipped to write about. What important issues are others not addressing? In CMF, we always used to have this question, what is it that only you can do as a result of the way that God has shaped you? Uh, what niche can you fill that others can't? And, and then what, also just from a practical point of view, what talks or drafts could you adapt? Uh, what, what work have you already done that has not yet been published that you could adapt? Don't waste your PhD or your thesis or your essays. Think of ways in which the work and research have already been done and the things that you've grasped could be readapted and repackaged for other media. Uh, so uh, what, what question, then the, the when question, when should you write? And uh, when the issue is relevant, so when, when things are in the media, in the, in the uh, public square, uh, are being discussed in the churches, that's, it's much harder to bring up a new issue. But um, go with the flow. If any of you are at Dave Patty's se uh, session this morning, on transforming teaching. He was saying very much from the model of Jesus that Jesus talked about things that were happening in the society and that people were uh, problems that people were facing. Uh, when, when you feel most passionate about it, uh, often the, the barrier is that you just don't feel passionately enough about an issue to be able to discipline yourself to do the writing. Uh, and often that's the way that God prompts us to by his his spirit, that he'll, he'll disturb us and upset us and make us feel uncomfortable until we start writing. But then there's the discipline element. You've got to make time to do it, and you have to make it a regular part of your life if you want to develop and grow uh, as a writer. And that, that means creating and protecting time during the week or during the term uh, where you're going to, to do this. And sometimes we need help to do that. And, and I, I found particularly in, in vo when you're involved in, in a busy job, uh, for me, when I was uh, at CMF leading an organization, there were all the responsibilities of leadership. And I was doing a master's uh, in bioethics and law. And I'd got to the end and just hadn't written the last bit. We had to write a 20,000 word dissertation. And I'd just put it off and put it off because there were so many other things that were more exciting happening that I was passionate about. And, and my, my board uh, actually said to me, look, we're going to make you take some time off in order that you can finish this thing. And they, 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 um, uh, they did just that and gave me the space to, to finish it. <clears throat> Where should you write? And you know, I hope we're wanting to write in a way that other people will read it. And so it's a question about where you can get published. And there are some places that are easy for us and some places that are hard. But uh, it, you've got to think about, you know, where could I get uh, published? And of course, 
in many ways it's a lot easier today because all you need to be published now is your own blog where you're the writer, the author and the editor. And if you get a following, you can have quite an influence. But think about who your desired audience is, who it is, who is it who's thinking that you want to challenge and change and where do they go? You know, think of the apostles. When Paul wanted to speak to academics and leaders, he went to the Areopagus in Athens. When he wanted to speak to Jews, he went to the synagogue. When he wanted to speak to uh, pagans, he went to the town square and uh, addressed them. So w where is the public square, uh, the people that we want to influence? Uh, where are they uh, dwelling? But where can we write that they read? Where should you write? And of course, we have, to th we have great opportunities now uh, in social media because anyone can get a platform. We'll talk a bit later about how you can use social media to draw attention uh, to your writing or others' writing and get it about. But uh, there are friendly publications, so uh, denominational or church organizational uh, things where as long as you're writing to length and it's understood and it's on the kind of issues they want to cover, then you're going to have a really good likelihood of being published and that may well be the, the field of people you want to influence. And then there'll be publications which, which target uh, specific interests and now with a huge explosion of journals that we've seen around the world, you can virtually always find one that, that matches to the audience that you want to reach and has the, the ready mailing list to, to do it. Let's just think about print media first of all and uh, newspapers in particular. And of course, newspapers going online has changed everything, but we still have the basic formats that you find in a newspaper. And so one needs to write differently for whatever you're targeting. One of the best ways to get started in the public domain is to write a letter to the editor uh, of, uh, of a newspaper or a magazine or a journal and uh, to, to look, at, look at what they publish. Uh, it's always got to be relevant to what's been published in the journal or as response to that or something that's happening or whether there's a discussion and dialogue already having. Uh, look at the, the style and the length they go for, uh, copy it, and uh, you've got a reasonably good chance if you're persistent of getting letters in. But now, of course, you don't need to uh, take time to write a letter. It was said by my predecessor at CMF that the average doctor, it would take them four hours to write a, a really good 250 word letter for a national newspaper, four hours. That's because these people aren't trained in journalism. A, a journalist could do it much more, more quickly. But um, the point is that it, it takes time uh, to do it. Uh, now, of course, with rapid responses, you can go to any article and put up a rapid response of just a few words or a paragraph or whatever in a very, very short period of time. And if you're up, the key to those is being there really quick at the beginning so that you can get enough upvotes so that when everybody else comes and, and clicks uh, just on, well, let's see the best responses, you've got a chance of being up, up there and being able to make a point. So being, making one point very uh, concisely and clearly and well. Uh, balancing quotes that uh, a lot of uh, the way uh, journalists work is that they'll have an article, uh, they want to make a point in it, and then they'll want quotes from each sides of the argument that'll, that'll put the opposite point of view so that they're quoting someone else rather than giving their own words. So <laughs> we were often contacted a Christian medical fellowship to say, well, there's a story about abortion or transgender or you know, um, tuberculosis in the developing world or something. We thought might, you might have an opinion about it. And so th those are the occasions where it's always best to uh, not to respond immediately online, but to say, look, how many words were you wanting? When by? And then to go away and craft something unless you're really confident about the subject, craft something really good and then send it to them and a good opportunity that you'll, you'll get your quote. And if it's a leading story, then you'll be on the front page and you, you'll be able to have an influence and make people think. Head-to-heads are longer things where a newspaper will ask you, you know, we're, we're addressing this issue. Should, um, 
you know, should puberty blocker hormones be given to uh, uh, adolescents or, or, or people before adolescence? Um, would you write for us 250 words saying no? And we've got someone else to write yes. Opportunity. The op-ed piece. Op-ed uh, stands for opposite editorial. And it meant that in the, in the print edition of a newspaper, the editorial, which is often the thing that people will go to and read first, if they read nothing else in the newspaper, they'll read the editorial. And the op-ed piece is opposite the editorial. So it's on the facing page of the editorial, and it's a longer opinion piece where uh, people are able to unpack their ideas uh, more carefully, and they'll have a set length for those, and, and of course it's got to be on something uh, relevant. Uh, headline news, probably more for journalists. Um, personal interest story, a story that you have that illustrates something that's being talked about. Uh, and then every journal or newspaper also has its regular columns as well. And a lot of those aren't filled by journalists, but by people with a really strong view in that particular area. And then, of course, every uh, print medium has its style. And we'll, we'll more, talk more about style in terms of the complexity of the language that's used and, and um, the way things are, are crafted and put together. And then every newspaper has its political positioning as well. And of course, if, if you're involved in public policy, you very quickly get to understand what the position is of every newspaper on every issue. And they're going to be wanting to publish things that resonate with their own editorial line. So you, you might write an article that's going to be published in one newspaper, but not in another. So we need to know what the uh, positions are. So, I mean, this is just an example, and you will all have a focus. What is your personality, upbringing, academic training, gifting? Where's that pushing you in terms of the kind of things that you want to write and focus on? For me, uh, my target audience, uh, ever since I became uh, working for Christian Medical Fellowship, was Christian doctors and medical students. I wanted, I wanted to challenge and help and encourage Christian doctors and medical students to, to think. So I'm, I'm thinking of them as my focus people group. And so much of my life has been focused on, on this and, and still is. And topics, for me, it was issues at the interface of Christianity and medicine, but particularly beginning and end of life issues. And then the format, uh, some of us will write books I was much more a person who wrote articles, blog posts, papers, booklets of up to about 10,000 words, and so on. So, uh, and, and the level, my level was popular rather than academic. So if you think of a, a bookshelf, and right at the top shelf, you've got the academics and the PhDs who are publishing theses and writing very, very long books, which very few people get to read, apart from those who are in the specialty as well. That's the top shelf. And then the bottom shelf are those you know, who, who are writing sort of comic books and things that are very popular audience. Whereabouts are you in that list? Where's your training put you? Because we need to decide what our, our niche is. For me, it was, it was really that I wanted to listen to what the academics were saying, but then put it in the language of the street so that I was making ideas that people weren't hearing, much more accessible to people who would not otherwise read their material. And so uh, that's another role to play, if you like, in the body of Christ. But, but what's, your, what's your audience? What's your topics? What's your level? We're going to come back to this at the end of this focus. So, uh, you know, it, it said with regard to, I think that the quote originally is with, with regard to greatness. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, some have greatness thrust upon them. And I think it can also be said <coughs> of writing and leadership and all sorts of things. But some are born writers. In our medical school class, we had a young man who scored 100% in the final uh, school level English uh, exam. He was absolutely brilliant. He just It was so easy for him to write, and he's still a great writer. But most of us are not like that. Some achieve uh, writing. 
through a long, painful process of, of good mentoring and being helped along the way and being disciplined and uh, persevering. And then others have writing thrust upon them. So in other words, they're just in a position where they realize that they have to write for their life and it's a necessary part of the job. And, and I think for me, I was very much in the second and third categories, but it was more the third and that I had writing thrust upon me. So I was uh, appointed to a position where if I didn't write, I'd be far less effective. And so uh, Christian Medical Fellowship was a gift to me because after a few years, I ended up as the editor of four different publications. And we had, we had a student journal called Nucleus. We had a, a graduate's journal called uh, Triple Helix. And uh, these were printed in English, but they went all around the world to various other Christian medical groups. So it gave a, a, a ready channel of being able to reach people like this. And then we, we had things we called the CMF files, which were 3,000 word pieces on a particular issue at the interface of Christianity and Medicine. You can see some of the topics there. And then we had a newsletter also. And each of these went out originally four times a year. So there were 16 publications for, and none of them were terribly long, but I was responsible for all of them. So it gave an opportunity where I had to write and had to learn to write, but also it gave a huge opportunity to be able to give writing space to others and discover other writers and develop them as well. So to find for yourself a regular outlet, unless you have it thrust upon you as I did, uh, uh, to find for yourself a, a regular outlet or somewhere where you can uh, publish. And then for me also, it was, it, uh, I was focusing on writing booklets on particular subjects that used about five to 10,000 words for a medical audience uh, as well. Uh, I've only ever written one book. It was, it was this one. Luckily, it didn't take very long because I'd had most of the stuff prepared in other formats already. And it's, it's a, just a reminder that to think about what you've got already that you can readapt into different formats. And then, of course, uh, after 15 years at, at CMF, of course, the whole internet thing came up and blogging and, and uh, all the rest. So there were, there were opportunities then to address any issues that, that came up and with ICMDA do much the same thing. <clears throat> in my new role, I'm not doing that much writing I, because I'm leading an organization where there's not very little space to, to do it. But uh, what I've tried to do is at least discipline myself to, to producing two newsletters every month. Uh, and neither of them are particularly long, between 1,000 and, and 1,600 words, but it, it keeps me focused and being able to make things accessible. And of course, COVID was really helpful for us because it um, expanded our expanded our, our mailing list from about 800 Christian doctors to about 10,000 in, in a year. And so if you've got a ready audience like that and you've got a means of being able to communicate them, with them, then, then, uh, then use it. Jumps on, yeah, so that's the newsletter. And uh, the other one I did was a COVID bulletin, which was eight short pieces um, every month on, on COVID. The COVID uh, period, of course, was a crisis, but crisis, crises are always made up of two things, a threat, which we all recognize, but also the opportunity that it brings as well. So behind every gray cloud of crisis, there is a silver lining of opportunity that we should look for. And we, we had an organization which was really based entirely because our aim was to start and strengthen national movements of Christian doctors. Our whole methodology was centered around two things, funding field workers to travel to new areas and, and encourage new groups and running regional training events. That was what we did. So of course, when COVID happened, I was on a plane about to, about to jump on a plane to go to Kazakhstan to be involved in a, a training conference there and COVID happened and I had three months of of uh, activities, 10 different conferences in different countries, and they're all just canceled. And so we're sitting there thinking, well, what do we do now? How do we, I think the word is pivot, you know, how, how do you change and adapt to use that new situation? And we really didn't know what to do, but we, so, so what we did was we tried a whole host of things, and some of them really uh, were total flops and a waste of time. 
but others of them really took off. And, and one thing we did was to, to start a group of webinars, and we initially, we thought, well, why don't we run a few global, global webinars on COVID and medicine, and we'll get someone to talk about the impact of COVID on pediatrics or mental health or surgery or you know, emergency medicine or whatever. And, and we could then draw, we think, well, who's the best expert in the world to speak on this? And we'd, we'd call these people in. And then we had the technology to be able to get it out uh, around the world. So we, we were getting people from, you know, hundreds of people from 60 or 70 countries tuning into webinars. And we thought maybe we're onto something here. So we just uh, started running them weekly at the same time, at the same hour, every same day, every week, and uh, just put a system in place. And then last week, we, uh, we ran webinar number 105. And uh, when there's no shortage, and now people are queuing up to be able to speak on these things. You know, I've, I've got 10 more topics I could address on, on this thing. So think, think about ways, and, and of course, these are a great source, because if someone's done the, the preparation in terms of producing a really tight half-hour talk and PowerPoint, then it's not a huge journey from that to write it up as an article or a blog or, or something like that. So uh, you, can, you can get things. So think particularly of talks you might have done that yourself that you could spend less work doing.